So today let's take a look at the disilluminated magnifying glass. Let's try to see what's inside of it, how does it work, and let's try to fix it because it's broken. It has this cover which protects the magnifying glass against dust when it's not in use, and it totally doesn't make it look like a toilet. That's an amazing design, isn't it? Nice! And here's the switch of it, and the cable, it runs on a mainness voltage, and of course for the power of it, the cable is quite thick, and from the other side of it, there is this, the magnifying glass and this fluorescent tube, and probably some ballast or inductor, or most likely an electronic fluorescent driver, because it's probably too small and lightweight for a classic traditional iron inductor. Let's try to plug it in. And, of course, the switch is on now, and when I plug it in, it briefly blinks sometimes, but it doesn't work. And there is a dark spot on the tube, so it's most likely the tube bed. But anyway, let's try to open it and see the internals. There is a transparent cover for the tube, so let's remove it. It's on six screws. The screws are removed and it opens like this, and here is the tube on some holders. It clicks in here and it comes out here, or is there a socket for it? Or is it on a cable? Well, it has this socket. And as you can see, the tube has four pins. Each end of the tube has a heater, and each heater goes to two pins, and the heaters should be between those two pins, and the other one between those two pins. And so let's try to measure the resistance to see the heaters, are they fine or blown? And this heater is about 3 ohms, and the other one... The other one seems to be open circuit. But anyway, let's take a look inside of this anyway, to see how does it work. Let's see what's inside of this. And it opens, and here's the electronic driver for the tube, dangling on one screw. So let's unscrew it, and that's it. And of course I forgot to show the marking of the tube. It's 22 watts and 6500 kelvins, which is daylight color. And the marking on this cover is... Here is the main voltage, the power, and the socket of the tube. And here is the electronic fluorescent driver, on a single-sided board with just true hole components. I can see a fuse here, some interference capacitor here, a bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes, this primary smoothing capacitor, well, just a smoothing capacitor, because there is no secondary side. The tube is not isolated from mains, of course. Some interference inductor here, and some other interference capacitor. Some resonance capacitors, maybe. And it's more or less a standard self-oscillating bipolar fluorescent driver, with this inductor in series with the tube. And this capacitor where the starter is in a standard fixture and some DC blocking capacitor in series with the tube, and this base driving transformer with three windings. One is in series with the tube, and the other ones are driving the bases of those transistors in a half bridge. They are bipolar, probably, and of course, yes, those very common types, and they are just alternately switching at a frequency of about usually 30 or 40 kilohertz and some base resistors and a couple other resistors and probably a diac in the startup circuitry, which is quite typical for those circuits. And it's all very similar to compact fluorescent drivers that are built into compact fluorescent lamps. It just has slightly bigger transistors and the inductor even has the inductance written on it, 2.7 millihenry. And of course, this is kind of an obsolete technology in the era of LEDs, but anyway, it's still interesting, and let's try to reverse engineer the schematic of it.
And here's the schematic of it, which is quite similar to more or less every compact fluorescent lamp or fluorescent inverter. And the mains comes in here, there is the switch, the fuse, some interference capacitor, the bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes, the smoothing capacitor, some interference suppression inductor, interference suppression capacitor and... Then it's basically a self-oscillating half bridge with a feedback transformer. And it has the typical startup circuitry with the diac. And those resistors charge this capacitor until this diac triggers and it gives a pulse into the base of this transistor, it turns on and from this on it starts oscillating. So now this transistor is on and it passes some current through this feedback transformer and so through the feedback it keeps itself on until the core of this transformer probably saturates and then the voltage for the base of this transistor disappears and there is no more current into the base and the transistor turns off and the voltage swings into the other polarity and it turns this transistor on and again it keeps itself on through the feedback until the transformer saturates or its core saturates and then it repeats and the operating frequency is probably given by the point where the transformer saturates. The saturation of the core basically gives the length of each half cycle of the oscillation. And there is some snapper capacitor for those transistors and once it's already started, this diode keeps discharging this capacitor in every cycle so it never again charges to enough voltage to trigger this diac. So it never tries to start it when it's already started. And this is important because if this transistor got a pulse into its base, when this one is on, it would be a short circuit. So once it's started, the startup circuitry has to be disabled. And as it's oscillating, the high frequency voltage goes into the tube. There is a DC blocking capacitor, so only AC, high frequency AC goes into it and it has those heaters and this startup capacitor, which passes some current through the heaters to preheat them and also this startup capacitor resonates with this inductor. When it's resonating, it increases the voltage to strike the discharge in the tube. And then the voltage drops to a lower level. And the current is limited by this inductor. And of course, when one of those heaters goes open a circuit, it stops running. But sometimes the heaters are fine, but still the tube doesn't ignite. And in some cases it may destroy the circuitry because as this capacitor is resonating with this inductor, there is a much higher voltage and because of the series resonance it also draws much more current and it may overheat those transistors. Sometimes if the fluorescent tube fails without those heaters going open a circuit, it may destroy the driver, especially the transistors in it. But of course some more sophisticated fluorescent inverters have some protection against this. And of course this inductor in the schematic is this one, and this feedback transformer is this one on the right ring. Almost every inverter like this had the same style of feedback transformer. And the tube has a screw on it, so let's try to open it and see what's under it, and it's basically just connections to the ends of the tube. The wire is going through the glass, and there is some seal and the heaters. And this one apparently is blown. And of course sometimes it's possible to fix it by bypassing this blown heater, but it's a dodgy fix and it may help to destroy the inverter. Now there is no open circuit, but if the tube still doesn't start, the series resonance of this capacitor with this inductor may overload it and overheat those transistors. So now the blown heater is bypassed and let's see what happens. And it actually flickers horribly. No, it doesn't run properly. No, it actually runs, but no, it flickers. And you can see that this end is getting extremely hot and it was glowing orange. It's overheating. It was red hot. 
this is definitely not the right way of fixing it and it could melt the plastic or crack the tube or start a fire. On the surface of the heater there is an emissive layer, which makes it easy for the electrons to go from the metal into the mercury vapor. But now the emissive layer is exhausted and there is basically just some bare metal and it's very hard for the electrons to go from the metal into the gas and so the electrode drops much more voltage and much more energy is lost when the electrons go from the metal into the gas and it dissipates a lot of power and that's why the electrode is getting so hot and this is not a proper operation. It's not a proper fix and also the light coming from it is not steady, it flickers. And if I was running it like this for longer, it would probably destroy the transistors or other components in the inverter. So that's it. It just needs a new tube. So this is Diagno Wild and see you in my next videos and thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate your support. And of course you can also become my patron to support my channel and get early videos. And I recently started my Instagram, the link to it is in the description. And of course I still plan another episode of this induction cooker and also some more dodgy USB chargers.